Welcome back everybody to our lessons in jurisprudence. In this video what we're going to do is talk a little bit more about natural law theories but we're going to do so through the lens of the uh, medieval and the religious influences that came into natural law theories of course in the early medieval period and sort of the high middle ages as well um, when we talk about um, the work of St Thomas Aquinas. We're going to divide this series into two lessons. We're going to focus on St. Augustine of Hippo in this lesson, and then we're going to talk about St. Thomas Aquinas in the next lesson. And the reflection of Augustine and Aquinas is almost very similar to the ways in which Plato and Aristotle understood and developed their natural law theories. And there's a good reason for this. One of the reasons is because when St. Augustine was writing, there was not the rediscovery of Aristotelian works and, and Aristotle's writings, which is obviously what influences Thomas Aquinas in a lot of ways and we can see this Aquinian um, uh, the or at least the Aristotelian influence in Aquinas's work in quite significant detail. So the traditions of the natural law would go about a radical shift and a major transformation and in fact this influence is really hard for natural law even today to, sh to shake off in a lot of ways um, because of the influence of newer religions, uh, namely that of Christianity uh, and the development and growth and explosion of Catholicism and, and, and Catholic Christianity, um, Christianity more generally, in fact, owing to the fact that um, Christianity goes from being one of the most persecuted religions in, in, in all of Europe and the Mediterranean to the standard religion of the Roman Empire and gets spread all across Europe, um, all the way up into Northern Europe, uh, all the way across into Eastern Europe, and essentially becomes the major default religion in the Middle Ages. So, like I've said, it goes from being an outsider religious movement, it goes from being subject to persecution, uh, to being the formal religion of the Roman Empire, spreading across the entirety of Europe and parts of Northern Africa, and continuing as the Northern Empire in the West, uh, sorry, the Roman Empire in the West falls, and we get the establishment uh, under Emperor Constantine of uh, the Byzantine Empire, which is sort of described as the Eastern Roman Empire, which goes all the way, all the way up until the sort of mid-1400s. The most important of the philosophical and theological thinkers contributing to this were probably Augustine and Aquinas. Augustine is one of the most important of the early church fathers, and so too is Aquinas in terms of the sort of high middle age period. So we see here that according to Wells, St. Augustine was an early church father living around the time of 354 to 430 AD. So a very in the very early periods, the early development of Christianity. And this is where Christianity was uh, in a, uh, we see a bit of a, 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 an interesting phase of Christianity in the very early periods, because ultimately Christianity is influenced very heavily by different theories and contributions to how to interpret biblical texts during this period. You get what are sort of known as heretical uh, practices within Christianity, so things like Martianism and Gnosticism. And then you get things like the formal codification of Christian doctrine and the formal codification of how theology is going to be interpreted and how Christian theology is going to be interpreted with things like the Nicene Creed and the Council of Nicaea, for example, and various other um, councils such as the Council of Constantinople. Augustine himself uh, was a, theolog a theologian who operated in a, in a place known as Hippo Regius, which is a part of Roman North Africa, hence he gets the name St. Augustine of Hippo. And his writings on Christian doctrine provided some of the greatest influence to the works of theologians and churches, um, the church scholars who came after him. So, for example, we see here that he developed a number of ways in which we can interpret the biblical text. So things like the doctrine of original sin and the doctrine of grace, which is linked quite significantly to the idea of ori original sin, are some of the elucidations about and some of the elucidations about the Holy Trinity are things that were contributed by St. Augustine. So the idea of original sin in and of itself isn't a thing that is specifically cited in the in the biblical text. It isn't specifically cited in, in, in the book of Genesis, for example. Rather, it is something which is interpreted by St. Augustine as uh, the idea of individuals and human beings having original sin as, as they are born, and they have to essentially repent through the concept of baptism, uh, to uh, the sacrament of baptism, to eventually become um, uh, at one with, with, with Christ and with God.
These are all ideas that came about and were ultimately adopted by the church and become part of the formal doctrines of, of, of church scholarship. Uh, it, so too was the conceptions about the Holy Trinity. Some of the major debates that takes place in this early, early period of, of, of Christian theology is about the, the, the concept of the Trinity. And it would be first adopted by the First Council of Constantinople in 381 AD. But of course, you're not here to learn about uh, theology and the history of theology. Um, you're here to learn about law and to learn about the philosophy of law. And so how does Augustine interpret his conception of the natural law? Well, I've already mentioned here is that uh, the, the influence that is made uh, and the distinction that we can make between Augustine and Aquinas uh, on the basis of natural law theory it relates to the influence of Aristotle. And I've written here in quite um, in quite confusing language uh, the influence that Aristotle had over both of them. Ultimately, Aristotle had no influence or very, very little influence over Augustine because Aristotle's works had yet to be rediscovered. But, of course, when we talk about Aquinas, you can see very much that Aristotle and Aristotelian concepts uh, influence his theories. Not only his theory of natural law, but a lot of his other theological and philosophical theories as well. So when we think about how Augustine approaches the, the concept of law, we can see the theoretical conception of law, which is more akin to the ideas that we saw when we looked at Plato, when we looked at Plato in our Origins of Natural Law lesson. And one of the major similarities that we see um, here is the fact that Augustine, the way Augustine understands the human condition, he understands it as being a struggle between the concepts of good and the concepts of evil. And that ultimately submission to the will of God is the most optimum outcome, the most optimal outcome for an individual to essentially to to essentially operate. Now, this has been somewhat similar and can be somewhat similar to a platonic understanding of a submission to a higher authority. He doesn't believe the higher authority is, of course, the Christian God, because Christianity doesn't exist when Plato was writing. But instead, he thought it to be more the idea of uh, submission to a higher authority, the higher authority of the philosopher king and the submission to the philosopher king. And so in reality, Augustine takes his theory of law to a far more extreme than that of Plato. So the idea of submission to God being the most optimal outcome is something that is quite interestingly applied. And we can make this clear connection between Augustine and, uh, and Plato in this regard. Uh, but when we look at Augustine, he takes it far more, uh, takes it to a far higher extreme. Because according to Augustine, the law which is of the highest authority, is the law which is derived from God. He calls this the lex eterna, or the eternal law. And so all other law, i.e. the regulations which form the positive law created by man, i.e. law that we are going to be studying, that we study at university, for example, um, is no need, um, is of no need unless one does not submit to the eternal law. So if you submit to the eternal law, then you have no need to even follow or even think about the positive law which is created by man. And as such, the concept of the lex temporalis uh, is, which is sometimes described as the positive law, the positive law, the concept of the positive law, is of very little importance to anyone, so long as they subject themselves uh, to the eternal law which is derived out of God. So it is suggested by Augustine, for example, in one of his famous writings, um, this particular uh, Latin phrase, which I'm not going to try and read out because simply I'm going to translate it. Uh, it directly translates to mean that the idea of an unjust law is not law. Now, this is a very famous quote that is attributed to a lot of natural law scholar, uh, scholarship. The idea being that when we think about the ontology of law, when we think about the actual existence of law itself, when we think about what law actually is and whether or not something is or isn't law, when we think about this in reference to natural law, uh, the, the natural law scholar will tell you that what is and what isn't law refers to and directly is attributable to the idea of uh, the nature of conferring to the concept of the natural rights, the natural morality, the, the, the concept of natural law as a moral principle. So they believe that there is an objective standard of morality that exists, and this objective standard of morality can be outlined in the natural law, and 
if a positive law, if a, if a law that is created by parliament or the courts, for example, does not adhere to the natural law, then it isn't law. The only law that uh, is law uh, in that sense is law which is attributable to the natural law. Okay, And that's where we get this phrase from. We get this from Augustine. Now, the reason why this phrase is interesting is because what Augustine was arguing here was that the rules found in the positive law are only just, they are only law themselves if they are also found and they are uh, coherent with the eternal law, the law of God. So as a result of this, there can be nothing found in the positive law which hasn't been derived from the eternal law, okay? Which is why Augustine argues that if you submit yourself simply to the eternal law, then there is no need to even consider the positive law as having much of an impact in your life. Uh, and so as a result of which, we are signifying here the importance that Augustine places on the role of the eternal law in conjunction to and contrasting that to the concept of the positive law.